So I was thinking to create a couple of videos related to the topic of mathematical modeling of infectious diseases. One of my students actually asked me whether I'm going to go over such a topic because typically, and I, I mean, I also indicate this in the, in the syllabus, typically if I have enough time when I teach the course on ordinary differential equations, I will, I will add a topic at the end of the class with some basic applications on uh, uh, modeling infectious diseases with some, some basic applications, um, so not not too sophisticated models, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, textbook models, so to speak. And another reason, and I don't think I actually have time with this situation and with me teaching remotely, whether uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to have enough time to add this topic to the class. But I was thinking to make a video which is basically outside of the course. So if, if the, my students watch this, um, are watching this, this is not... Um, part of the mandatory part of the class this semester. You are certainly more than welcome to uh, go over the math uh, as we go along on, on this presentation. It might be actually better understood later on in the course when we reach uh, the topic of systems of differential equations, because for now we still deal with um, single um, ordinary differential equations. But another reason why I wanted to go over this topic um, is because Something bothered me quite a lot in the in the last couple of weeks or months um, with respect to the confusing, in my opinion, or misleading or quite wrong in some cases recommendation about wearing masks or um, whether one should cover the face. Um, you know, if if an epidemic is going on, and if that person goes in the public in crowded places or not. And I, and I know that there are um, deeper considerations against uh, initially against uh, wearing masks, the, the issue with uh, making sure that uh, these masks are available for the medical personnel. And of course, this is a very um, important consideration because um, the medical personnel is the most important um, category of people that needs to be protected right now. But it's still misleading, and in the way it's presented, in my, in fact, I think uh, caused quite a lot of damage. Not so. Uh, first of all, in in, in terms of um, misleading statements, whether they make a difference or not, because I think they do make a difference. Again, whether it's a mask or even a scarf on the face, it would it could potentially make a difference, especially in high uh, density areas. But another problem is that. Um, people might actually mistrust uh, authority figures or institutions that uh, in crises like this actually should um, portray a level of trust. Because let me start with the conclusion and the conclusion will be illustrated with um, a numerical example in a later part of this, uh, this video. Let me stay with the conclusion that I do believe actually that it makes a difference, and, I, and especially in high density areas. So if one expects that, um, so if one person cannot avoid a high density area, uh, let's say you have to go to a crowded store or you have to use public transportation because you have no other choice, especially in these situations, I think every little small reduction, however small reduction on the probability of transmission could actually make a big difference. And there is no feasible way in which one could argue that uh, covering the face doesn't actually reduce the probability of transmission, even by a small amount. So first of all, of course, um, the biggest impact is that one may not know he or she is sick, right? We had a symptomatic transmission. So in that case, of course, wearing a mask makes a huge difference because any cough or sneeze is contained over the face. So in that case, even a scarf will be uh, obviously uh, useful, but even in terms of getting the disease, which is because it's true that, you know, regular surgical masks or um, just a thin scarf won't protect completely from, uh, you know, getting small particles like viruses, but it might reduce to a degree, just, just a small degree, maybe it protects again big particles, maybe, you know, um, someone just coughed uh, or sneezed um, in the vicinity, in you know, um, and you, you happen to be in that fraction of second right there near the person's mouth, 
I still think uh, there is a small chance, however small, that the um, um, the probability of transmission will be reduced. And in the context of uh, high density areas and a fast spreading disease, again, this this could make a difference. So that's the motivation of this video. So let's get to the math first, and then uh, we're going to get back to this discussion in the last part when I go over the, the numerical example. So this requires some background in, in differential equations, obviously. Um, even if you didn't take differential equations before, with some basic calculus, you might be still be able to, to follow through, or at the very least, trust the method I'm going to go over and just focus on the last part of the, um, uh, the discussion when uh, we're going to end up with an equation that gives us a way to estimate the number of people who uh, are eventually infected or um, yeah, who are eventually infected. So we have a bunch of, uh, we have three differential equations here, and let me go over the, the meaning of the variables briefly. All of these are functions of the time t, so these are categories of people. S of t are the susceptibles of time t, which are healthy people who can still be infected, so not immune to the disease. Uh, I of t are the infected of people of time t, and R of t are recovered at time t. And for now, let's assume that there is no reinfection, so that we run this model just for one instance of the epidemic when um, um, run its, when the epidemic runs its course and then um, people are not reinfected uh, within this time frame. Um, so the parameters are the infection rate, which I'll talk about in more details shortly, the recovery rate R, and the death rate. So let me come up with some numbers here, and I want to make a disclaimer here. These are not official numbers from the COVID uh, epidemic, okay? Kind of in the same ballpark, but I didn't, didn't have enough time to actually look in the literature to look carefully what is the exact uh, best estimate for this para each parameter. So let's say that the recovery rate, which um, is assuming, let's say, that the course of the disease is 14 days, more or less, that will be 0.07 the time units in these in days, and the death rate, let's say it's 0 0.002, um, which, you know, kind of it's related to maybe a 2% death rate over 20 days or something like that. So, I mean, assuming that uh, those who are infected and who didn't recover after 20 days, they may die. Again, not, not official. Let me write it down to make it clear here. Not uh, official numbers or real numbers, just close a little bit in the same ballpark. <clears throat> and to simplify the discussion, suppose that I'm going to apply this model um, to a high density population, so high density, small community uh, of um, 1,000 people, let's say. Think of it as a dorm or a small college or something like that where people are very well mixed um, and then there is an equal probability of meeting either of them in a given day. Um, so the model should be uh, to an extent self-explanatory, right? As time goes on, the infection rate or the number of new infections is given uh, by this um, incidence rate, right? A proportion of the, well, I'll talk about more on what what goes on in this term, but the um, the infection rate, of course, is depending on both the susceptible and the infected. So you need both uh, healthy people who are exposed to the disease and infected people for the epidemic to run its course. Um, so a period of time, you have a removal from the susceptible that goes into the infected class. So that's basically going from susceptible to infected. Then we have removal rate from the infected class for two reasons, recovery, so this, this part goes uh, to the recovered class, and this one goes outside the, the model because this represents the death um, of the infected people. So some of the people are recovered, some of them um, die. And uh, before I move on with some math on how to analyze the uh, ultimate fate of the epidemic, because obviously the main question everybody is asking when uh, running these models is uh, how many people will be eventually be infected. So how many people um, will be infected eventually? 
<clears throat> and one thing to notice here, and we could do this with some basic intuitive mathematical analysis, is that eventually, of course, I of t goes to zero. So eventually, the epidemic run its course, runs its course, and there won't be any new cases. And let, let me illustrate mathematically why that's the case. But eventually, let's keep that in mind, if we take the limit as t goes to infinity of the infected class, this is going to be equal to zero. Now, this is not by default good news or bad news, because it depends what happens before this uh, outcome, before the epidemic ends. I mean, so what's the damage? Okay, how many people will be eventually, eventually infected? So let's look at the math a little bit here. Notice that in the beginning, let's say, let's say we start in the beginning with nearly everybody healthy. So we have the so-called patient zero, right? So we start with one um, infected individual um, out of those 1,000 people. So in the beginning, the uh, epidemic will grow very fast because the um, infected individual will meet only healthy people. So the probability of meeting healthy people is very high. And it continues to be high as long as you have enough susceptible in the population. So imagine in the beginning that this portion here, this term is really big, and this one not so much. Because again, there are not many infected in the beginning, so there's not much removal from the, from the infected class. So this is why in the beginning, um, you, you see policymakers talking about this, this curve increasing exponentially very quickly in the beginning. However, as the susceptible number uh, decreases, so as you run out of healthy people, then this term continues to, will start to decrease. But notice that the removal rate is the same. So there will be always a fixed number or a fixed rate of recovery and a fixed death rate. So as this term, as the source for the infected people continues to decrease, um, the removal rate stays the same. So eventually the removal rates overcomes, or it's much bigger than the input, than the source of the new infection. And so after some more time, then eventually I goes to zero. Now, in the moment when I is equal to zero, so when you reach this, this limit for the infected people, there's no more movement in the S and R class. So you know from math that when S prime is equal to zero and R prime is equal to zero, then the dynamics uh, stops. In other words, S of T, R of T, neither increases nor decreases. So then the question is, what is the final size of S and R? So notice that the smaller the size, or let's put it this way, the bigger the size of R is, the more people were infected. That's because each, each recovered individual was one who was infected beforehand. So basically, a good outcome is a small r uh, and a big s final value. Okay, a small r means not so many people were infected, and that's equivalent to having a big final value of s of t. On the other hand, if the model predicts a very small value of s, maybe close to zero, that means everybody or nearly everybody was infected. So um, one thing I want to mention before I move on to the second part, in this term, in this lambda, the infection rate, there's quite a lot actually that goes in, uh, which is the reason actually lambda, when you run uh, these models with, let's say, um, values that you pull them out of the hat, so that means guessing values, so to speak, you got to make sure that this lambda is not actually too big to make sense because there are lots of probabilities that reduce the transmission if you think about it. because what needs to happen for a successful transmission of the uh, disease well from the point of view of one infectious individual because that's how this this um this parameter is built from it's built from the point of view of one infectious individual um there's going to be so one typical uh infectious individual will meet in a given day, period of time, will have contact with a fraction of people. Okay, just meeting, right, in the hallway, whatever, right? So there is 
a fraction of people you're likely to meet on average in a given day. Again, this is assuming the population is well mixed, right? So let's say in a, in a college uh, of 1,000 students or a, or a dorm, you're likely on average, of course, to meet, let's say, eight, nine people in a given day. More in a certain day, less in another day, but let's say on average eight or nine. That is not enough for the transmission to occur. You need to multiply this by the probability of meaningful contact. Right? Meaning that it's not enough to meet the person, you have to maybe be close enough to the person for the transmission to occur if an event that leads to the transmission, such as a sneeze, let's say, or a cough, then actually reaches you. Because if you say, let's say, hello to uh, a person that you meet in a given day from seven feet, that makes the difference. Because if it's less than seven feet or less than six feet, um, then you get a transmission if the person sneezes. If you're at six feet or more, whether that person sneezes or not, that doesn't make a difference, right? I mean, you won't get the disease. So, so this is a problem that further reduces the value of uh, the contact, uh, the transmission rate. And then, of course, is the probability that, that that person actually sneezes, right? So the probability of getting the virus. So I'm going to run the model, or I'm going to run the example with this. I'm going to illustrate various factors into lambda <clears throat> that further reduce the uh, the value of lambda. Okay, so again, think of it as average number of people or a fraction of people you meet in a given day, um, how likely you are um, for each in this of these individuals to actually be in close enough contact, meaningful contact for the from the point of view of the disease, and how and uh, further multiply by the probability of getting the virus, which you can think of it as. Um, uh, that person basically uh, being close to um, close enough um, that if you sneeze, uh, you actually um, get you know give the virus to that person. Actually, this is from the point of view of the infected person. So this will be basically the probability that you actually sneeze or cough or whatever the event uh, should be that will um, infect the other person. So on the second part of the video, let's go over a little bit of math on how to actually um, come up with some estimation of or an equation that gives us the final size of the epidemic, the final size of S and R. <clears throat>